Hi, everybody. Great to have you all here with us today. I'm Rajshree Pati, founder of India Design Forum, and I'm joined by Mrinalini Gadiok, architect, writer, researcher, and co-curator of this program. We are very, very happy to welcome you all to this first session of India Design Forum Architecture Debates, Building Blocks. The idea really germinated from many conversations over the months when we found ourselves repeatedly questioning what builds the blocks of architecture. So we thought, let's fearlessly question the mechanisms that make architecture relevant today. This is a platform where we bring together leading minds from the architecture community to share their perspectives, curiosities, and inquiries about what really builds this community. Through these discussions, we hope to provoke thought and create discourse around critical ideas that often get forgotten in the midst of our daily duties. We want this to be a very casual, candid conversation. And uh, we hope that by the end of uh, uh, the talks, you would come up with some questions. We look forward to that. Thanks, Rajshree. Um, I'd just like to add, hi, I'm Rinalini. I'm the co-curator along with Rajshree. And um, just to add to what, she, what Rajshree was saying is that it's been very important for us to establish a space where we can have open and, con and honest conversations. The, like Rajshree said, it's, it's not a formal uh, sort of question and answer session that we're going to have today. We've got some fabulous, fabulous speakers, and we're hoping that, you know, we can actually get to hear what they have to say in terms of what they feel and what their personal experiences have been. Um, we would have loved to do this in person and sitting in a room together, but, and, you know, beyond the formal barriers of digital screens, but we do hope to keep this conversation um, candid and informal and encourage our audience as well to participate. So please send in your questions and your comments. If you're on Zoom, you can just put them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you're on Instagram and Facebook, we've got a lot of people from across the world. Do send in your questions and comments on those platforms as well, and we'll try to pick them up. Um, because we've got such a large audience, we do apologize in advance for not being able to get as much as we can. So let's begin. So uh, without uh, taking up more time, let's kickstart this uh, series by talking about what is good architecture. And to discuss this rather wide subject, we have with us none other than Mrs. Brinda Somaya, Anil Schoenfelder, and Sumitro Ghosh. None of them need an introduction, but we must. And it is my absolute honor to uh, welcome Mrs. Brinda Somaya. It's especially special for me, considering Mrs. Somaya was my first ever professional uh, interview that I did. And today she's here with us to kickstart our initiative, uh, which is the idea of building blocks. Um, Mrs. Sumaya is an architect and urban conservationist who has led her firm Sumaya and Kalappa Consultants since 1978. Over four decades, she has merged architecture, conservation, and social inquiry in projects, ranging from institutional campuses and rehabilitation of an earthquake torn village to the restoration of an 18th century cathedral, showing that progress and history need not be at odds. Thank you very much, Mrs. Maya, for being with us. Neil Schoenfelder has been a dear friend for many years and I've known his work very closely. Neil has had an extensive experience working in Paris and in uh, Pondicherry and now in various parts of India and the world. He's just come back from New York from a project. Uh, which led him to found Mancini Enterprises in 2004, a design firm for architecture, interiors, objects, furniture, and landscapes. Based on his experience in Europe and exposure to the Indian ground realities, he's been designing and guiding uh, the technical implementation of design ambitious projects in India, working within heritage buildings and his special interest in the work culture of building have proven to be have proven to be the driving force in his understanding of the different project realities and the potential for contemporary architecture. Welcome, Niels. And of course, lastly, but not least, we've got Sumitra Ghosh, who I have had the pleasure of working with on many occasions, whether it was analyzing projects and doing articles together or discussions and panels, and even a very fascinating installation uh, exhibition that we did earlier this year. 
Uh, well, so Mitra is a partner at Matthew and Ghosh Architects, co-founded with Nisha Matthew Ghosh in 1995. Uh, their work spans across the spectrum and ranges from projects and ideas to do with urban, research, space, architecture, interiors, product design, and much, much more. His experience of working with prolific designers, teaching at different schools, being juror and panelist on multiple occasions, adds to his personal interest in politics, philosophy, culture, and history to understand the world we live in and work within. So very warm welcome, Shamitro. And given that we've got such an eminent panel and we've got so, such wide interests that are sitting before us today, um, the topic that we've got at hand is what is good architecture? It is something that we are faced with uh, very often where people you know, make these blanket statements and they say, this is great architecture or this is not great architecture. Um, so we want to begin this series and we want to begin tonight by asking the three of you how you consider or what you consider to be good architecture. How would you define it if you would at all? Anyone can start. Brinda, why don't you start? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rajeshri, and thank you, Rinalini, for inviting me to the evening. Um, we did have a little discussion earlier and I find the term good architecture itself a question mark. Uh, after hearing what Sumitro and Neil have done, I think we need to ask the question, what is a good architect rather than good architecture because of the amazing width and diversity of an architectural practice today. So having said that, I did talk about how architecture is so subjective uh, it varies from person to person, from place to place, country to country. And what might be good for A is not necessarily good for B. At the same time, you cannot get away from the fact that there are standards and there've got to be standards of design. There's got to be something aesthetic, which is good or not good. Uh, or as, you, as we've also discussed, what is not good architecture? So I think that there is a, we have to create a balance between these two things that it's not something homogeneous, but at the same time, there are standards that need to be upheld. So finally, I decided why not just look up the dictionary and see what they say good architecture is. And it was quite interesting, I have to say. They said good architecture has three aspects to it. One is durability. That means whatever we build must remain in a good condition. And I thought that's quite interesting, especially in India where we see the condition of our buildings in the urban and the rural areas. The second thing that was defined was utility. They said we built for the people who are going to use the building. So they, it must function well and they should be happy. And finally, they talked about beauty which we also discussed earlier, where there should be delight in your work and it should raise the spirit. So I thought these three uh, important words were not really off the track. They did have some meaning. So then I decided to look to what a good architect was. What is the definition of a good architect in a dictionary? And the three words that came out was passion, creativity, and adaptability. So I just thought that I would start with these thoughts and the dictionary meaning of what we're going to discuss today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sumaya. So Mitra, would you like to add to that? Yeah. I, actually, this is something which I want to, um, possibly I want to pose another question which is more uh, uh, because it will be interesting for us to know what we thought was good architecture when we were studying and what we have realized it, it, it means to us now, you know, so, so in that, um, so I, I think um, I would love it if uh, Niels or Brinda pick up on something of what, what we thought and what it has become. So I was wondering, you know, um, I mean, we grew up on the works of the masters and quite, which is a very different time, 
it's it's a it's it, it's all it, it all belongs to a time of which is kind of what we call as the modern i mean in um, apostrophes it's it's really called the modern and there is a certain sense of heroism there is certain sense of the personality there is um the creative genius uh, which has gotten diluted as i went through the profession as to what good architecture meant uh, what i thought was and so it becomes a much more negotiated condition actually the the, the practice becomes um much more um aware and i think perhaps that's the change of time and and space that uh, it happens that the meaning of good architecture itself it has modified itself where um there is possibly a uh, uncertainty number one about what uh, we believe is right and on the other hand is <clears throat> is also a a growing sense of awareness of changing conditions so that i think has had an enormous impact in in kind of evolution of uh, what i have seen in the meaning of good architecture so nils what what do you uh, say well i i like to maybe add to both of you um a point i think the the um word delight and the, the beauty aspect of those three pillars is possibly maybe the the vaguest uh, of those and it's there where we can easily lose uh, a common ground because it's so it's so individual but i do think there's one one level to that aspect of delight which maybe we can nail down and maybe that has remained constant uh, throughout the years of, of our practice is there is a I sense there is a sensorial threshold that when it's crossed in a space by a design, by a garden, it could be a single room, it can be an entire building. But when that sensorial threshold is, is crossed, uh, you have, in a way, circumstantial evidence of delight. That is when people start touching the walls and they start touching the materials or the furniture that the hand runs along some countertop uh, or, or work. I mean, on, on a construction site, suddenly step back and take out their phones and take pictures. They have no, they have nothing to gain from taking a picture. Not, they're not going to use that mm. to advertise their companies. They're, they're employed anyway. There is, there are these moments where I, from observation, I do think there is circumstantial evidence of delight, and that, for me, is a is a, a good indicator that now you're heading into good architecture and it doesn't fulfill. It's not the only criterion. Criteria. I think a building which does that to you can still be entirely wrong for a city, for example. Uh, so it's not the only um, the only um, threshold to be to be jumped over. But I do think it's an important one to that there is an almost physical effect on anybody who uses the building. And then the second one that, that relates to what Sumitra just said is, well, is that building which maybe does that, is it right in the cultural context? Uh, does it fulfill the, the aspiration of the modernists uh, we have been uh, told should be fulfilled? I remember in school, we had a professor who did a, a sort of uh, hop and top show. The, the, the lectures were giving us the plans and one image of each building and he would say this is good this is bad this is good this is bad this is good this is bad and uh, that had its place in education because that was a way to expose ourselves to many um, um, uh, currents in in modernist movement but it completely lost anything pre-1910 uh, there was no example from the 1500s or the the Middle Ages or the Roman Empire or you know, whatever. And I think that that physical threshold can link that up. The physical threshold crossing that can happen in a modernist building, it can happen in a ruin of uh, 3,000 years old, and it can happen in a, um, in a completely vernacular village setting. And so I like, I, I like to 
try and step back when we when we have these discussions in office and in the studio and say, are we at least approaching the physical threshold where we can expect some sort of well, delight because uh, so many so I use that word. But doesn't this also then, doesn't this take us to who is defining the idea of what exactly. is good architecture, mm. right? Like you said, your professor literally yeah. brought up these examples and said, this is good, this is bad. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to a point which is very subjective. What might be good for one person might be bad or not bad, but let's say not the greatest for the other. Right. Also, may I add, uh, when uh, uh, Brinda said standards of design and who sets these standards um, of design? I mean, things have been moving so rapidly so who really also defines these standards? Or who should be? Maybe Samaya? You know, I think these are all very, uh, these are all words, you know, which we're discussing today. And I think one of the most difficult uh, professions to discuss and debate about is architecture. And no one word, uh, I mean, it's such a complex profession. Uh, it, it, it goes from, from A to Z, you know, in terms of, of what we connect with, whom we build for, where we build, do we build for the site, do we build for the land, do we build for the client, do we build for the people, or do we build for ourselves? probably a little bit of all these things. So it can never be a single stand. Each one of these aspects of architectural design and building will have a separate uh, set of standards that have to be uh, incorporated into the work that we do. Now, whether they're equally balanced or whether the architect's uh, uh, creativity is more important than the utility and the function of building or the land is less important than the materials that we use and how sustainable it is so that it can't be measured so easily it, it's very it's a it's too complex uh it's not like it's not like uh, the vaccine that is being measured today one dose and half a dose and two doses and things like that so i think the complexity of architecture is also its greatest mystery and its greatest delight. And that is the reason why many people don't really know what an architect does. Apart from asking if we are in architecture, which still happens even today, uh, they often ask, what exactly do you do? And this is not necessarily people who might be from rural areas or people who may not be educated in the sense that we talk about education. But the complexity of the work that we do makes it a very difficult profession to evaluate and understand. I like... Of course, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, sorry, I was just picking on one of your terms, which you said it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and it's a mix of a lot of things, uh, which sort of uh, places architecture in a very difficult position. Um, um, I, 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 while thinking about it, I was also uh, came to my mind whether whether the thought about thinking about what is good architecture is also what uh, Manalini talked about was who defines is also what is the definition of good life and what are we trying to address with the good architecture. So there, I think, is a crucial uh, question because most of what we um, see uh, generally seen in the in the media as an aspiration for most um, in most of the magazines is po possibly uh, pretty much unachievable for a large population it's a very large uh, so i think there is all it sort of places architecture into a space which is um, aspirational uh, desirable attractive and yet very difficult to have the means to uh, do that. So here I <clears throat> um, I was looking at 
some early paintings and uh, uh, some of Vermeer's paintings uh, and certain other across the world, they actually talk about ordinary life. And I think that's where there is a shift. There is a shift where ordinariness is seen as a, as a, as a daily challenge as much as this unachievable aspiration. So I think there is in, in this idea of good architecture is also enmeshed the question of the good life and can the ordinariness of, uh, of life become noble just as the thought of architecture as, as, uh, as, as a noble gesture was imagined earlier. Just a thought. But do you think that this also kind of begs to question the idea of the creator, consumer, and the observer, and how each one of them are rather separated from each other? And yeah. like Mrs. Sumaya said earlier, right? Like there, there's so many stakeholders and so many agencies that come together to make architecture. Yeah. And there's so many um, sort of <clears throat> levels of how architecture is created. And it's not just the person who's actually constructing it but it's also the person who is commissioning it. It's also the person who's observing it from a distance who might not be directly involved. How do we bridge that gap between all of this to create that, to create the ordinariness of life or to overcome that, in fact? Yeah, yes. In some ways, um, I would like Niels to react after this. Uh, um, in, in, in some ways, I think it begins where, uh, the biggest problem is put on the architect's plate to resolve in the in the mind, and that is perhaps where um, the role of the architect as a thinker come uh, and in 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 um, in today's terms, it could also be the negotiator who's negotiating these different situations, and uh, sometimes subverting, sometimes otherwise. Um, that the architect is put in a position to understand this whole uh, fairly complex, um, um, you, you know, uh, to evolve the idea, but also understand the whole uh, logistics and the delivery mechanism and the number of people involved. So, of course, my interest uh, has always been um, uh, in in the uh, in the in the former, which is the beginning, uh, that's where I find it's the most interesting because it's the most complex and it's it's all uh, in the mind. So I think I'll leave it to Niels to pick on this uh, from his experience. Niels, we can't hear you. Uh, you're on mute, Niels. Ah, no. Yeah. So, um, I do think there is a, um, when you talk about ordinary spaces, ordinary life, and what is the good life, I do think there is a, um, a common, a constant to all of those players involved, whether that's a client or a person building it or a user. And that is the fact that we all walk in with our bodies into the space. I'm coming back to that sensorial threshold. And it is, we all know instinctively which one is the best table in a restaurant. We all know it's, there's, it's a fraction of a second and we know where we want to sit, or, we, or at least where we don't want to sit. And that is our ability with our bodies in space with the light and the, and the acoustics and all, you know, whatever forms the physical atmospheric qualities of the space, we react to that. Uh, in a very strong manner. And for me, that is um, a constant everybody can relate to when walking into a space. Of course, that doesn't apply for the magazines and the photographers. That's a different, what is good architecture for them may be different. Uh, but everybody who walks in, I think, has that, at least that commonality that they can sense um, whether or not the room is, is right. That's vibrating. It's too bright. It's and when the sensorial threshold is crossed on the, on the wrong end, it can be really disastrous, and it becomes unhealthy, and people get sick. 
and then the sensorial threshold, the quality of space in that in that sense is crossed on a positive, it can it can create delight. I, I have never had in the few instances where we had these kind of reactions, I've never had anybody doubting it. Not the client, not the not the contractor, none of the stakeholders would have would have uh, doubted that that particular building or that particular room or garden, at least on that sensorial level, was right. And then you can disagree on an intellectual level. But then that's that's a different matter. Then our culture comes in, our education comes in, and we can have um, real discourse about what a society should afford or not. Um, but that does not, sometimes that I think uh, takes away or that that is so strong those those notions of the cultural and, and the intellectual aspects that one forgets the, the sensorial ones. Niels, may I just sort of disagree a little bit with that? I mean, when I drive uh, to Kerala, I see these amazing old houses all being torn down and these ghastly new shades of bright paint that paint companies have come up with just being painted. I mean, uh, if you look at, um, I think, um, um, you know, Vivek Vilasini did a very interesting uh, work, a photography, where he showed uh, different uh, photographs of these really bright, contemporary new built houses. Um, and, and so if what you're saying is true, these people who culturally have lived with so much of the nature, with brown tiles and wood and all of this, why would they bring down these homes and bring build these ghastly buildings with bright colors that completely distort uh, their environment? Sure, that's a good point. I mean, I do think that the cultural conditioning is in many times in that obvious case stronger than the trust in one's own sensorial uh, experiences. So the, the fact that now for some, I don't know whether it's the vast do when you know it's, it's, it's auspicious colors or uh, because the neighbors have the colors. Now I also have to have um, a colorful house. That's, that's cultures and, and society working its um, sometimes dirty tricks on the, on the minds of those who can spend the money. Um, and we have that at all levels. I fully, totally agree with you. We have that at, at, a, at a fairly um, humble village level, but we also have it at the level of skyscrapers and, and massive uh, public makeup projects, these kind of aberrations. Um, but uh, I don't think that that means that this, the, the sensorial judgment of uh, the person who has broken the old house and built a colorful house is gone. I just think that's overruled by the, the cultural conditioning and, and the media and, and uh, maybe the cement industry who likes to advertise a lot in villages uh, what, you know, with those big painted walls uh, is, is, is very powerful. And, and those uh, conditionings may, I think are dangerous in some aspects when it comes to build space. But I'd like to add over here, I think we can all agree that uh, all of us are more or less like-minded people who come from a somewhat um, sort of, you know, a similar aesthetic value. But there are people out there who are different and they are, everyone's limited in their perspective and in their expression of their perspective from, uh, they're limited by their own experiences and their own exposure. So it, you know, what we are doing right now is also intellectualizing this whole idea of what we feel and what we experience. And I think that is at, at the same time, having said that, I feel that there might not be enough intellectual discussion and discourse happening in this field. We did touch upon the idea of criticism and critique um, in our previous discussion. And we were talking about, you know, who is it who actually says that this is good or this is bad or coming to what uh, Rajshree also mentioned earlier, the idea of creating standards. Who is this person who's creating those standards and, and actually establishing what works or doesn't work? Mrs. Sumaya, you, you were mentioning something about um, an article that someone had written about your work earlier. I think that might be an interesting thing to bring up at this point. Thanks. Yes, um, 
many years ago, Professor Raman, he was a professor at the University of Edinburgh, and then he went on to Turkey and finally um, South Africa. And he heard about my work and wrote to me and whether he could write. Uh, he was married to an Italian and there was this Italian magazine Space and Society. So he chose three of my projects and he covered them. And uh, when the article came out, it was very nice. And he ended by talking about how I did appropriately. And he heard about and my work and wrote to me and whether he could, and whether he could write. And he chose three. Is that is is there a problem with hearing me? Okay, now you're clear. Okay, and uh, he said how uh, my work is uh, how I build appropriately, and at that time I thought you know what I was almost disappointed you know what sort of word is that appropriately you know it wasn't wow it wasn't this it wasn't special it it wasn't full of delight it didn't raise the spirit or did it or did it do all these things as well. Anyway, that was me and I didn't try and become anybody else. And after many years when I won the competition to restore the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, I studied a lot of Louis Kahn's writings and works because you know research is so important when we build as architects. And there I read uh, in one of, his, one of his paragraphs where he talked about the importance of building appropriately. And uh, it, was, it was very meaningful for me uh, to read that. So building appropriately is also very important. And I think that word is not used adequately uh, in, our, in our profession. But who would you expect to be saying this about people's work? Well, unfortunately, uh, as we, you know, we know that we just don't have uh, architectural criticism in our country at all. And this to me is one of the greatest dangers and sadnesses that we have in our profession. We have good critics for books. Uh, you know, you read about that uh, every Sunday in any newspaper. We have music critics, we have art critics, but we just don't have architectural critics. And this is a very sad state of affairs. And I think we as architects are partly to blame because we have very big egos. And I don't think most architects like their work uh, to be uh, evaluated or even talked about. And uh, one person I would like to talk about because I believe that India could produce someone like her uh, would be um, definitely uh, Ada Louise Huxtable. You know, she was not even an architect. She was actually an art historian. And she said something very meaningful when she evaluated work. She looked for humanistic meaning, artistic power and civic engagement in every project that she evaluated. She, uses, she used that as a base. And she believed, uh, and she was known through her writings to actually shape public aesthetics. We don't have anybody who shapes our uh, architectural or public aesthetics at all. We talk about intellectual rigor, we talk about high design standards, but we're all talking about ourselves or we're talking about magazines which praise us and dare not say anything negative uh, about the situation. This I believe is the greatest weakness uh, and we have maybe now one or two, but in our profession. And I feel that if this changes, uh, we, we all, I was saying that perhaps your, uh, you know, Rajeshri and you could create a, a sort of a background and ability to bring up architectural criticism and writing, concentrating on it, high standards within us. Rajshree, you're muted. Sorry, can't hear you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Brenda. That was definitely, um, uh, you know, um, loaded. Um, I loved what you said. Um, 
Yes, so um, Niels, you come uh, from a very different uh, environment. You've been, um, uh, you know, you're European. Uh, what are your comments about um, uh, critiquing architecture and why do you think, and I'd ask this of Sumitra as well, uh, that it hasn't happened in India as yet? That's a, that's, that's a very difficult question. I can only really wild guesses uh, are coming to my mind. I do think that maybe it is when it comes to aesthetic choices representing important cultural moments in India that we, that I see a lot of importance given to um, singular events in time. So that is the marriage is an enormous aesthetic event. And there is an enormous amount of um, uh, thought and means money um, being spent on a marriage. And, and that applies to any kind of family, whether that's a, a huge marriage in a city or whether it's a humble marriage in a village. The, the proportion of attention lavished on that event in time is huge. And I do think there is a very acute uh, uh, sense of what is right for the marriage to decoration, the food, uh, the invites. Uh, there is ample proof that that is, that is, um, that is the fact there's such a huge in industry around it. So there must be, there must be such uh, attention paid to it. And, I, and maybe that's the, the singular event in time may outweigh, or maybe for some cultural reason, I don't know why, more important than the constant architectural backdrop which we produce in, in our cities or um, um, in our infrastructural um, projects. I, I would include flyovers, dams, bridges. All that doesn't receive, I think, um, the uh, attention it deserves because enormous public money is spent on it. And, and I, I do agree, Mr. Sommer, when you have on, on a Friday newspaper, you have critiques of music, uh, very erudite, very eloquent, um, um, and they really go to the heart of the performance and take it apart and make cultural references and connotations. The work a critic, a critic would do. Um, but if you compare the level of public spending on music and public spending on infrastructure, uh, then it's even more striking that there is no uh, criticism of, of architecture and infrastructure. So, in and so, I, I did, so these are two aspects here. Yeah, I think there is maybe that the focus of what society believes important is more captured in, 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 sh in shorter events in time and not necessarily in the backdrop of, of our cities and, and architecture. That could be, it's a working assumption of mine, which I'm trying to explain why uh, that there may be a lack of criticism. So I, um, um, I, I'm just touching upon uh, um, maybe two things which could be, I'm, I'm not sure myself yet, uh, whether it's um, uh, one is that we are as, as, as a culture is um, uh, we do not feel uh, that we uh, should confront, um, that's one. The second, which is a more problematic space actually, which is that we either don't have an opinion or refuse to have an opinion mm. uh, on something. And I think that's that's something which uh, could have a historical frame to it. Um, I mean, like what Niels talked about that uh, professor would, you know, say that this is almost say that this is right and this is wrong. You know, that one had a framework to judge something. Now that comes from a very strong philosophical or a, or, a, or, a, or a social context which might be most likely post-war um, and has of course evolved uh, over it. So for, uh, for, for uh, a lot of uh, our framework will actually become post-independence in to a large degree which is um, a socialist uh, position and um, so it gives not only a philosophical space, uh, as a space of uh, and a role of responsibility, um, 
So I think there is a framework uh, not to prove something right or wrong, uh, but I think we sort of resist um, or avoid the question. Uh, and I think the third point would be that there is so much to do and it is so difficult to get it done mm. that everybody is busy doing that mm -hmm. rather than <laughs> passing opinions or having any opinions or time for opinion <laughs> on others' work. But I would, I mean, the most wonderful uh, experience I had was what uh, Aniket had organized and um, Samira and uh, Arjun Malik and uh, uh, I had, uh, we were comment, uh, sort of trying to understand each other's building. And I think it, it was wonderful. Um, where it became, um, because then you're really trying to get into the other person's shoes and you're also trying to, um, to try and understand the being and from where their work comes. And it is actually another alternate narrative. So I think that could be an interesting space to, um, you know, look at. Um, and um, uh, perhaps it will open up a lot of windows for all of us. So Mitchell, if I can just add, when you talked about um, having an opinion, I think as a culture, we're not encouraged to have an opinion. We're, we're always, um, you know, we, we've always been very subservient with what, what is being said and to follow that. And like you said, we're not, we are mostly non-confrontational because we are polite or we're taught to be polite. Yeah. Um, and I think what happens is that, and coming from a media space, this is something that I've, I've tried to have conversations with architects and designers for many years. And I've tried to kind of, you know, say, let's, let's get into actual critiquing, but it's one thing to um, it's one thing to have an architect or a designer who is accepting of of critique, mm -hmm. and it's another to have somebody who is equipped to be critiquing them. Um, and I think, like Mr. Sumaya said, there's a dearth of both of them in the country, unfortunately. Um, but what also happens is that, or where I I find it a little confusing, is that when we go through school, design school and architecture school, we go through school through crips. Right, where we are constantly being critiqued by people, whether they're peer reviews or whether they're professors. But the minute we step into the professional world, there seems to be this sort of cloud of uh, either self-doubt or something that kind of descends upon us and we are not open to other people's opinions. And I don't necessarily understand why that happens. And it's definitely happening more today in India than anywhere else. Maybe there is a sense of... Uh... Um, an unfounding, unfounded sense of threat, you know, which, which is whether it's a, from the intellectual space or from, um, from, you know, number of uh, jobs that you get, but that's all unfounded. So I don't think it damages anyone. Um, and as long as it is something which is, I mean, the only, uh, um, the one page which Architectural Review used to produce, which was a, called Outrage, I think. It was called Outrage, where they would call out the bad, uh, um, you know, what they would define as bad, and it would be splashed as a big thing, you know. Mm. Uh, but of course, that generated conversation, so which is fine. Uh, and somebody took a position to, to actually define why it is not good. So that's also interesting. Um, thing to look at yeah i think because a lot of people and a lot of actually architects have behind closed doors will say yes let's let's do this let's do that but when it actually comes down to doing it mm. um yeah there's not a lot of forthcoming <clears throat> energy there mm. this is my oh, no, it yeah, could but, be also yeah, because sorry no no it could also be because of the of our own history of architects and architecture and what is architecture post our independence. We had, of course, as Sumitra also mentioned, the great masters, you know, whether it was um, Tanwinde and Korea, Doshi, Reval, uh, you know, all, all of them. And uh, they, they were never criticized. I mean, they were like masters, they were like gods, you know, uh, bringing in a modernist movement into India, building all the greatest buildings that were built post-independence. And we all revered them. We were almost mm -hmm. scared of them. And they were treated like gods if they uh, came to a campus or talked to anyone. So there was no question of questioning them. 
there was no question of criticizing them or even discussing their work in any negative way. And we all know how many of these buildings function. We all know how many of the residential houses and buildings that have been built by the great masters are absolutely unusable. And even the owners of these buildings will talk about it, but architects will never talk about it because we, we feel that we cannot be disrespectful to the great masters. Yeah. And I think this idea continued, unfortunately, after the great masters, uh, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, when younger architects began to come in and began to do their work, this sort of reverence and this sort of non-interference in, in commenting about architectural practice continued. So it was almost a, a culture that was created, I feel, at that time. And recently, when the younger people, you would think, would be more broad-minded, uh, I have a, a I know of a situation where there was a young architect who built a building which was published internationally, and a very revered uh, elderly uh, professor gave an architectural criticism of that building in the same journal, and they mentioned to a group of us how upset and angry and what written words came from the architect to the elderly professor, questioning the review. So naturally people are hesitant if somebody like him gets into so much issue with a young architect about a building, how are other younger people going to be able to, to evaluate and fairly criticize more senior people's work? So I think it was, it was never in the culture of our architectural community. It was completely eliminated by the gigantic personalities that came post-independence and worked in our country. Very interesting, uh, Brinda, what you just said. And in 2012, though, when we had the first India Design Forum at Delhi, we had a whole session on uh, Chandigarh for and you know, against. And we had a set of um, um, practicing architects, young, senior on both sides. And it was very interesting to see um, um, both sides debating about it. And they were totally polarized. They either loved it because they accepted what the master created and the other lot against were vehement saying this simply doesn't fit in. So, I mean, I disagree that Indians don't have an, we have an opinion, we're highly judgmental and critical of everything. So it's really surprising that in architecture alone, we want to be zipped. Is that because uh, we, we think, oh my goodness, if I say this, he'll say something else against me and my practice and I will not, I will not get clients. Is there something inside, um, especially the, the younger art architects uh, that makes them feel very vulnerable to criticism. So I think, um, may I come in at this point? Um, um, I think one, <clears throat> I mean, uh, I was discussing something during my student days with uh, Kurla Varki and, and during the conversation it, um, and I think uh, one thing which uh, I think Brinda rightly pointed out that we, um, maybe as a culture or as from within the profession we placed, um, um, we almost made gods so that we actually could not question them or it was actually not right to question them at all. Um, but I think the scene was a bit different um, with um, um, at least what I have, having met of, uh, whether it's Doshi or Korea, um, these were people and are people who are very open uh, to conversation and uh, criticism. And uh, Warki's point was that unless you are able to uh, create an argument or play or put forth an argument by which you can displace the position of the previous one, you have not won. Mm -hmm. So, which is a very good thing yeah. that I cannot dismantle something um, till 
I have found the strength to have an argument strong enough to put against that. And this is not that one is talking about uh, demolishing, but I think it's it's about uh, um, the conversations um, have, I mean, if, if one looks at, because I myself have questioned a lot of, let's say, uh, the phase when a number of people, uh, which included uh, all the uh, Indian masters, uh, Korea, Doshi, uh, Uttam Jain, um, who were making um, miniature paintings, uh, which were, you know, uh, around their projects. And also the imagination was shifting in a particular, it was also, uh, so I think one thing which I completely, um, uh, the way I see that all these masters have been in a, they have evolved over time. They do not have a singular position. They have actually grown. So I think we should not see them as static minds. They have actually grown. And that's why when, when they were doing these paintings and I have some, so I was wondering, are the, and Frampton had written um, about critical regionalism and um, La Febre and a lot of uh, conversation was going on about uh, other cultures keeping their identities. Um, and at that point, it was becoming, uh, where are they playing to the gallery or uh, they actually genuinely feel so? And I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer to this. Um, so maybe they, it's, it's a mix of a lot of things. They are also in a kind of uh, a space where they are trying to understand where they are, what they are doing. And I think to see people as human beings who are trying to negotiate and understand, um, I think the greatest thing to appreciate is the growth that you can see in these practices to learn from. I'd just like to add over here, and this is something that did come up in our previous discussion where it was referred to as the elephant of the room. And um, it's, it's very current and we, we are, of course, we've got people who are actually commenting about it as well. The Central Vista project in Delhi, right? Yeah. Which has literally split the architecture community down the center yeah. where people are for it, people are against it. There are massive movements and uh, lobbying that is happening and has reached various senior levels. Um, I'm not necessarily asking you to comment on the project, but just what is going on with it and the way it has been critiqued or criticized. Do you think that has been relevant or do you think that has been productive in how it's been done? Stand today, Niels? Well, I think there are two sides, there are two very distinct features to that process. There's one criticism of the actual process of decision-making um, and that can be criticized regardless of what the content, the actual architectural project may be. And then there is the architectural project, which also that deserves a, a critique as well, of course. So I think there is, sure. I think those two are a little bit mixed up at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and because the process is attacked or the process is being doubted, um, therefore the content can't be uh, of quality or therefore the content should be doubted too that there's a risk there. Um, but I do think that it certainly hasn't reached a level of public debate uh, early on before um, decisions were made at, at political levels which to, to be called a, a well-founded um, public project. If I, if I compare this, I'm, I'm, I'm hard to compare because it's such a big and such an important thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to my mind comes a similar situation as national identity at stake would be the um, reconstruction of the Berlin uh, Schloss, I mean, the, 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 uh, the castle uh, in the center of Berlin in lieu of the um, East German seat of government, which was pulled down from, from the 70s. Um, and so there, it, it's been decided that they're, they're putting back the, the facade of the of the historic uh, um, castle in the middle of modern Berlin. And but that is happening after years of public debate. And so 
the debate will not stop, but you cannot say that uh, there hasn't been public discourse. Mm -hmm. and it has been an opportunity, it has been used as an opportunity to negotiate what we consider uh, culturally relevant at the center of our capital. Uh, and I don't, think, I don't think that has happened. I don't, I, I don't think that has happened in, in a, to the full extent in the case of the Central Vista project. Okay, so that brings us to the question of who is responsible for good architecture? In a country as, as diverse as ours and, um, you know, um, with different kind of architectural legacies, not South, West, East, whatever. And so who actually, um, you know, defines uh, what is good architecture in that sense? Who makes it happen? Who is responsible? So it's always the person who signs the check, isn't it? So then in India, it comes down to um, the government, the policymakers, the industry, um, the wealthy clients, um, but largely um, government is, is, is perhaps the largest client for architects. If I can so, put this in, in, in a different context, actually, also, is that, let's say, if we take the Central Vista as an example in itself, right, the government is commissioning the project, the architect is designing it, and he becomes the creator, the government be becomes the client. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the, it's the public that's supplying the money for it, right? So does that, so in that respect, does the onus actually lie with the, with the people? And in that respect, does that mean that we need to have more public debate and more critique and criticism before it gets built? Or do we, do we stop the buck at the government? Very relevant question. Brinda? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, there's no doubt. I mean, I agree with Niels 100% uh, that uh, there was inadequate public, uh, there were two, it was very clear that there were two aspects to this. One was the actual uh, how the project came about, how how it was, what were the documents, how was it, uh, how was the pre-qualification, who all were allowed, were young uh, younger architects also, how, did you make it possible to get uh, truly competitive solutions with from the most creative minds in this country? Now, from the other point of view, people will argue that a project that is as complex as this cannot be done by a young architect. Now, this is where I differ because I believe very strongly in collaborative projects. And I believe if the inquiry for a project like this did permit collaborations and you know, gave adequate time, uh, financially also you know, not impossible EMDs and things like that, then younger architects can tie up and work there are other architects because a project like this needs many, many verticals, many, many disciplines. It's not the work of one single company. And there are not many organizations which offer all these uh, services to a project. But you cannot just stay with organizations that offer all these services, single organization. The government has to be open to collaborative uh, grouping of different highly talented people who can get together and then try for these projects. I mean, in other parts of the world, I know in Holland, I visited a, a town where uh, the master planning was done by an architect and then they, and planner, and then he or she went out to six or seven different architects and asked them each to create a part of that town, making sure that in, there was a, a balance, making sure that there was some harmony but giving creativity its, its truest freedom. So there were many, many ways that the government could have applied its mind for a project of this scale and of this importance to ensure what Neil said, that there was public discourse, public acceptance, and it's taxpayers' money. So finally, the public should feel happy that something is being done. And this is what I feel that, and I feel other projects, which are, as he says, the government is the biggest uh, client. There's no doubt about it. And uh, even for, I know for uh, universities and campuses, you know, we might, uh, my studio might make it because we have certain numbers, we've done certain size, 
but I'm sure there are lots of very, very creative people who should be able to compete with us on these projects. So this is a change in my in thinking. And this change is not going to come easily unless we have architects who finally must become politicians and bureaucrats and policy makers right in Delhi. Otherwise, we're always going to be peripheral to society, even though, again, as the other speakers have said, unless construction comes back, the government is saying, oh, construction is coming back. Now the economy must be revving up. Everything depends on infrastructure and construction. The economy of our entire country depends on that. But do they bother? Is there anything that, that connects with that sort of value and importance? No. That's a very interesting point. I, I'd like to add to that. When all the healthy debate, public discourse up front can be fueled, and maybe one can look to other models of how, how it works elsewhere, is that, well, when educational institutions are publicly funded, and those institutions then create critical opinion and well-founded critical opinion because they're allowed to conduct research in the history of art, history of architecture, uh, or, or engineering for that matter, then you have, a, you have an ecosystem of uh, maybe um, policymakers and, and administrators who want to push forward and get things done before the next election. But you also have publicly funded universities who can criticize that from a very strong standpoint. Now, we, we may have the first, but we don't have the latter. I don't, I don't think we have enough really well-funded uh, schools of architecture, publicly funded uh, schools of architecture, who produce, who can then produce the, the, the breeding ground for, for criticism of, uh, for example, government projects too. Yeah, so I think that there, there is an element missing, and that missing element may explain to some extent, not to the full extent, but to some extent it may explain why we don't have um, um, the critical discourse and public discourse up front. And that I'm sure you as a, as a, as a uh, media, as a publication, uh, with your background in, in magazines, and you, you, I'm sure you find it difficult to find collaborators um, for your content who bring exactly that to the table. So then you can, with confidence, publish uh, a critique in a daily newspaper or in a professional media. <clears throat> so Mitchell, you were saying. Sorry, you're muted, can't hear you. Yes, yeah. sorry, I was not able to unmute myself. Okay. Yeah, I agree with uh, completely uh, uh, on the, from the perspective of, uh, for the Central Vista project, uh, what both Brinda and Nils spoke about, um, but I think that the, um, my, in my opinion, the the picture is actually lies somewhere else. It is outside the space of architecture completely. Uh, it is uh, whether it's uh, one calls it, um, I mean, which is perhaps you can call it an opinion, which is that it is it is to create the sense of grandeur and and uh, uh, the notion of the creation of of a new um, you know era or whatever it's so it it has dimensions which are beyond uh, so here the role of architecture can only be of supply and nothing else um, and the choices can be rather um, specific and uh, of a certain kind uh, and that's where there is perhaps no space for uh, creative freedom because I think it's also the definition of, of what uh, a country and its political system and its future political system could mean. Um, so these are patterns which possibly will unravel a future which is yet to open. Um, so whether it becomes these grand schemes or it becomes the grand statues uh, instead of what Niels talked about, about uh, state funded schools uh, where conversations can happen. And we are all familiar with how conversations are generally uh, not welcome for sure, generally throttled. So there are um, 
so in in some ways uh, uh, if we are uh, not expanding the territory of conversations i think there is a bigger problem at play which is uh, much larger so the central vista of course what the architect what the design is i think prem chand the worker and various other people have uh, have opened out on the architectural front and the process front uh, but i think the the game play is completely at a different scale uh, so there i think i feel the architecture part is the, the almost the powerless tool you know when you uh, talk about public debate and we have to open it out for public debate you're talking about you know what percentage of public i mean today you we live in a country where you know having a flyover is what the public thinks is progress it doesn't matter if the flyover is, is falling down on the next storm or it's leaking or it's badly constructed but people chennai for instance has been you know in the process of getting their flyover built over several decades and when i go there and i'm commenting about it you know i speak to the taxi driver or the the common man and they say but you know we've got a flyover we're so proud that we our city has a flyover but they're not looking at the quality you know so public debate itself i mean we have to raise the bar of of awareness you know for people to 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 have to to for for them to feel the right to demand better better quality better quality in infrastructure better qualities in every aspect of their life it's a much larger issue in india that we have to confront if if i can uh, also just add to that i think so we've sort of touched upon this earlier about how everyone is so consumed by what they're doing currently what they have in hand is that we're unable to kind of step back and look at the larger picture and also we're just um, we're so hand to mouth with everything that we do right and we're so seeped in in mediocrity that everything is okay even if we get a little bit it's fine mm-hmm. because we don't know better but don't you think it's kind of time to get over that and and raise ourselves beyond it i think well we- i would like to say here that we should uh, you know we know there are big issues but i i don't think that we don't have creative architects today who are doing great work in our country and we have lots of young people we have lots of of course older people who are doing all types of wonderful work and uh, i think there's a lot of creativity there's freedom in their work and we may not have the government as a patron you know in olden days as rajeshri said it was the maharajas who were the patrons of music art and architecture and they had their high aesthetic standards themselves and that's how they ensured that whatever they supported and paid for also came in within a reasonably high standard now we don't have that situation you know so it it naturally things will be very very different but i think we, uh, we should not be so despondent i think india you know i recently have organized that conference in january of women in design and uh, of course i know what other uh, firms are doing as well and i was quite stunned by what people are doing in our country in in many different things in the built form in architecture and graphics and landscape design in interiors uh, in all sorts of related fields so there is great creativity going on they have freedom but how how they are going to make a difference to 1.2 billion people that's the difficult question and a very difficult situation that we are all in so there are no miracles i just tell young people today two or three things i tell them while you do your contemporary work while you do your sustainable work also take up a project mm. in a rural area or a, and take up a project that in conservation you don't have to be always the conservation architect from york or america or england we have a natural sense we can also do that make sure your studio does different types of work uh, different vertical different disciplines so that that's in my opinion 
the true role of an architect. We are guardians of our built and our unbuilt environment. And I, for one, definitely want to trust the next generation of architects. So while we, we may not have been able to define what good architecture is, but we're definitely defining what a good architect is. So I want to use this opportunity to pick on the fantastic point which Brinda brought up about uh, doing, um, you know, um, a practice which is dealing with current uh, new buildings as well as the old. And I think this is where there, there seems to be a big gap. And what she's possibly referring to uh, is, is about the learning. Um, and I, uh, that in the past there was, we have such wonderful buildings from the past, from different eras. And uh, suddenly there was a complete break and uh, an assumption that the modern age and modernity will find the solutions uh, for a future, for a better future. So all the wisdom of generations and construction and place and material and details was overnight lost by the simple assumption that the way forward is a completely new one. So I think this negotiation of or partnering or finding that gap uh, is is a very interesting um, space to be looking at, um, whether it's about technology or whether it's about processes, uh, materials. So I think there's a great opportunity and I'm glad that point has come up, which is actually missing in a large way in the education and perhaps a very valuable thing if it becomes part of practices that uh, you're, you're sort of in between two kinds of time zones. I think the, the bigger, uh, at, a, at a philosophical level, I think there is, uh, while uh, our traditional beliefs have talked about more about cyclic time and cyclic histories, uh, modernism actually talks about a linear path forward. So there is that disjunction, you know, there is a complete break. And so I think looking at that gap will be a fantastic place. Well, you know, Sumitro, in India, we believe time is cyclical, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm just saying that that's where when we moved on the modernist uh, uh, one way forward, uh, we lost something. <laughs> yes. Niels, would you like to add to that? I think you're, you're being muted. Can we unmute Niels, please? Yes. You unmuted it. I, I do think that's a very, um, very important point. I do think that the, um, the way buildings are perceived and consumed in a, in a society, in a culture like India, where, we, where I don't think we had the same um, break of continuity we've had in Europe due to the two wars. And I don't think that, therefore, the modernist promise applies just the same way it did in Europe and in, in India. I do think that's a very big mistake to, um, to believe in, but it's true that this modernist promise sort of was imposed, not necessarily only in the architectural schools, but also via um, five-year plans and via economic realities where today we have a very limited supply um, situation of high quality solution or of, of, of adequate, appropriate uh, um, solutions for, for buildings. A simple example is that whatever we do in civil work is cement. There is only cement plaster, cement mortar, there's cement blocks. But it's absolutely, uh, uh, it's, it's well known that there is gypsum and there's lime which everywhere else in the world is still used in, in, in industrial ways too, not only in, in, in craftsmanship ways, but we have completely lost gypsum in the line, almost. And it's, it's a good example how the, the, the cement industry, which was obviously built and prepared um, in, the, in the early years after independence because construction had to go fast, how we are now suffering from that, from that loss of knowledge just simply on the supply side. And I do think that to uh, what, what Sumitra says, there is a, there is a similar loss of um, cyclic um, 
knowledge, appreciation of old buildings, uh, which the modernist idea has, I think, wrongly imposed on cultures like uh, like these, which have not suffered to the same conditions, which were at the very beginning of, or, or at the very reason for the modernist movement to happen. I think this would be a good uh, good point to bring in uh, some of the comments and questions that we've been getting in. We've been we've got Virendra Vaklu with us, who's actually questioning whether as good architects the question is the purpose of architecture and does it set off from just buildings brain if you're here could you unmute yourself please is brain with us still yeah i can hear you now okay great i the host had to unmute me so it was <laughs> not in my power to do so <laughs> yeah Yep. Good, to, what, good to see you here, Varen. Yeah, Would you like to you pose so your question? No, I feel it's so interesting. The entire range of uh, inputs by, by all the three key participants is amazingly di uh, diverse. And it starts, which I love very much, because it's very dear to me, what Neil said about the body and perception of beauty through the entire, um, I would say, the tools that the nature has provided us with. And I think the tool is, the brain is as much a tool of the nature's development and evolution as is are the five senses. And I feel um, what, what has to be more probably uh, independent of history and independent of any other forces, uh, time and over again honed are actually the recognition of these very tools. I feel, I feel what we are losing is our own relation to our body. I fully agree to that. I mean, we are ready to give up in favor of uh, more, more modern tools like devices that we equip ourselves with. We are ready to surrender it as against what we have already. And if you see today also, and I think there the discussion about beauty gets diluted. What we have today is even the craftsmen that are still available randomly and there I connect to Brenda very much in the vernacular or the rural uh, domain. Those people are very good equipped to express them with, with artifacts, could be building, building details that are instantly perceived by us through our body in a very satisfying and delightful way. Where does that come from? I mean, it definitely comes that the honing of the body is still with the craftsman intact. While those who have moved to the drawing board and there I have a problem. Even I think the architects don't know when they're drawing something up or model that their product would be delightful. It's highly speculative that it turns delightful. There's no guarantee for it. Historically, and I think it's very interesting to see what um, uh, this Dutch architect says, I'm just uh, missing his name. Uh, he developed this, uh, this uh, zoning plan, the SA SAR zoning plan. I'm just missing his, Abraken, yes, Abraken. Abraken makes a beautiful statement. He says, the development of architecture in the public domain, when it came to housing and houses, till, till the 19th century was not the duty of the architect. There was a pattern, a grammar that repeated itself. Only the public iconic buildings like churches, temples, banks, name it, until date, that were designed by architects and subjected the, to, to kind of heroism. But the ordinary building, the row houses in the urban, urban uh, setup all across the city were always based on a grammar. If you go today to any medieval place in Europe or India, how come that the architecture fabric is so cohesive that even a new coming architect from the modern period or postmodern period can't destroy it so easily? The robustness of the historical medieval or even later is so intact and there must be a reason that they are so intact. Because simply architects have gone over their response field of responsibility into domains that were never their domain. The housing, the houses, they were done 
very much with people, for people, and along with their sensibilities. We have actually taken away the sensibility of people to provide uh, themselves with the skills and the continuity of their skills. We have to emancipate people again to recognize beauty. I think that's the biggest task. In my opinion, that's my statement. Reflecting about an emancipation of the public all across the world. India has even bigger chance today to recognize it because we, not only because we are a large democracy, I, I don't think that has to do, because everybody actually is an anarchist. Every client, every contractor is actually questioning the architect and we know that if you do something, the participation by a client is immense in India. In fact, you have to give the space. One has to only channelize that talent of a client. One can't deny it in India. We can't deny our clients. Europe, it is much easier to perform as an architect because you have been put in the role of a heroic architect. Please build me the most beautiful house or building in this village. Of course, you will do that because you are you are educated to be like a hero as an architect. You are revered as an architect. And if you are a professor as an institute, we know that Niels knows it best. I know it from my education. Professor in architecture means you are a daily god. That's my, <laughs> my little contribution to what I've been hearing. Yeah. Would anyone like to respond to what Varen is saying? It was bit much, I guess. <laughs> Too long, not too much, too long. <laughs> I think it's good points. So something to think about, yeah. Food for thought. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, other comments. Yeah, Ane here also. Yes, so Ani, I believe you have something to say to some of our speakers. If you could unmute yourself. Can we unmute Ani? Yeah, Ani, you yeah. can go ahead. I have been unmuted. Yes. Um, I, I will not uh, make it so long, uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> I think what uh, Somitra said about um, the uh, changing conditions and that we all got our architectural education in the 20th century and um, things have really changed. And uh, I, I just hope that um, we will be able to take the responsibility of our uh, interventions in the built environment that they reflect something of the 21st century and not just what once upon a time we got educated because so, we got it educated from professors who were already 20 years older and they studied buildings that were already 20 years older. So I think that that fourth dimension of the... Ariane, we seem to have lost you. I think he's the connection. Yeah, he's, uh, we seem to have lost him. We can come back to uh, what Ani was saying once he reconnects. Uh, we do have a couple of points from Pooja Narayan. Pooja, if you're here, would you like to join in? Is Pooja here? So Pooja was keen on um, talking about the Central Vista and she also says that she wanted to comment on Mr. Samaya's point about how long is this so-called quote unquote timeless architecture of the great Indian masters to be preserved, she asks. What, um, and she's saying, is there sort of like a, a time limit to what makes it great or at what point do we decide that, okay, you know, it's time to let go. And this is in fact a debate that I've always had uh, with people saying that when we're talking about conservation, at what point do we say that we just let buildings live their lives or do we want to keep preserving them to uh, eternity? Mrs. Omaya, if you'd like to comment on that. Well, you know, of course, great buildings were built during the, those uh, 40 years by the masters. They had a lot of relevance then. They still have some relevance now. My point really was that it's not a straight line after that. 
And we have to understand what did that do to our sensibilities? What types of buildings were built at that time? Those buildings were built for a specific purpose. I think Anil, somebody else mentioned, you know, architecture, it's not standing alone. Architecture reflects the times, you know? I mean, you can talk about right from the Roman empire, the Greek empire, it's all architecture that we study to understand society, to understand the economics, the culture of that period, what you study. You Through the architecture, we have learned so much, whether it was Berlin during the uh, Second World War and what was built over there in the 1930s. Architecture always reflects politics, economics, and, the, and culture of maybe some people, not the entire country. So there's no doubt about the important role that architecture uh, has in a country. It goes way beyond buildings. It goes way beyond providing space for people to work and live and you know study and whatever. So in the same way, the masters were, Nehru believed that he wanted to break away, I'm sure, from the colonial culture that existed before. And they brought in modernism. Now, the question which was raised by one of the other speakers was, we brought in, in a way, uh, the modernist thinking from the West, which was a different period at that time. So what was it that the masters could have done differently? It would be interesting to study. Uh, what was their philosophy? Uh, did they have to just bring in uh, certain materials and not bring up our own traditions in a contemporary way, not just through saying that something reflects this or showing a, a miniature painting or something and saying, you know, this is like that, but truly in the architectural planning, building, construction of its time. So it was done in a very different time and that time's gone in a, way, in a way. And now we have to think very differently, but it's not easy to remove those shackles, you know? And I think uh, after the masters, there've been no Indian architects who profess or who are known to be able to rise to that stature and that standard in the last 50 years. And why is that when there's so much more construction? Of course, the construction is not supported by the state anymore, like it was for the masters. So the construction has become through builders who may not be so concerned, through individual owners who may not be so so it's, it's complex, but it's worth looking into and understanding this aspect of where we are today. That's, uh, that's very interesting. It's an interesting perspective. We have Ani who's come back. Ani, can you, uh, Siddhant, can we just unmute Ani? We can come back to his question, please. Yeah, yeah. sorry. I I probably said something wrong. That's why they kicked me out. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, no, like like to, we uh, said, we don't we don't allow criticism. <laughs> no criticism. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I will end with that. Positive, but one good is, uh, I think what what, uh, what Brinda and Niels. Uh, I mean, first I need to congratulate you with this uh, fantastic discussion because this is exactly what you need to talk about it. Um, I think one thing that is absolutely missing and uh, that could not uh, be too difficult to change that, I think, in the coming years, is to organize many, many more competitions. The, uh, the young guns and the energy and the passion that they have, they only need a whole lot of competitions, uh, whether it is about an intervention in public space, whether these are maybe even a toilet or, or a bus stop or uh, whatever it is, but they are desperate to unleash their kind of passion and energy. And I think this is, this is uh, probably not going to be taken up by the government. And, uh, and to be honest, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to compare, um, let's say what's happening in, in let's say Germany or in, uh, in India. It is, if you want, you can check out the percentage of uh, how many architects there are in Germany compared to, let's say, normal people. Um, and if you do the same in, uh, in India, you will see the answer why we hardly ever talk about architecture. It is the percentage. 
the same of the percentage of building. Some people say, oh my God, Netherlands is such an amazing country, so much architecture and those things. It's just that three and a half percent of the buildings are designed by architects. Uh, and in India, it is maybe 0 0.00, I don't know, 3.5, something like that. Um, but I think these, these things will not change very quickly, but if you can unleash the passion and the energy of this next generation, this, you know, this 21, 21st century, even if they design temporary architecture, which is a light footprint pavilions, or, or these kind of things, it's very, very important to, uh, to do that. The last thing I'm, I'm actually taking a little bit more time is about the Central Vista. Um, of course, uh, I worked uh, two and a half years for the man in, uh, in Amdabad. And what surprises me is that um, uh, it's, it's pure strategy what is being done. It has very little to do with, uh, with architecture. Um, what, I, what I find quite amazing is, is two things. One is that there is hardly any debate. Um, I've, I've had some good uh, input from uh, Pradeep Krishna. Uh, about that this actually a Central Vista project is a landscape and about space. So you need to find designers who are very good with landscape and public space. Anybody can do a building. That is not a problem. Uh, but this is a national kind of thing. That is what happened. The second one that surprised me very much was recently, I talked to Verendra about it. In the Hindu newspaper, I think it's a relatively okay newspaper. There was a news article by uh, the former, uh, I think he worked for the Hindu, he, he became uh, the academic dean in, in Chet University, Srivatsan, and he he's considered as being an, an architecture critic in India, right? So he described the shape of your new parliament building as a triangle. Now, I think this is where things go wrong, because the shape of the building is in hexagon. So I think the fact that you know, even these basic discussions are not being questioned or not being uh, talked about. Or, or, right. This is something that uh, I hope will really change, but it's a very, very strategical thing. And, and I doubt uh, if, if that will happen. Anyway, thank you. So I think what Anne mentioned about competitions, um, yeah, it would be wonderful. I think the general concern has always been that they are not transparent or they get into complexities and other things. So I think hopefully if, if that, that this uh, culture emerges. And on a lighter side, I think why the Western nations produce good architecture is that because um, they know that the Indians uh, are waiting to come and see it. That's why. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, our government, as we know, I mean, whether it's the metros or whatever else, um, I think our thought is that um, we don't need to make things well and we don't need to make good things. We can always go to Switzerland to see it, uh, just like the movies. So, so I think, yeah, I think that attitude has to change to, to do things better. I think, Niels, you had mentioned something in our last discussion about how the government uh, builds to provide and not anything beyond that. I mean, it's a very important point uh, Annie made, and I think it's, it's very valid. If you take an example of, let's say, footpaths renewal, and you have to build 10 kilometers of footpath in a city, you have to spend the money anyway. And you'll have to buy uh, 10 kilometers of curbstone in granite. And that is a non-renewable resource and it's well used if the footpath is well made because now we are catering to the part of the population who can't afford cars and they uh, need proper footpath and that's, that's a, it's well agreed. But we never get the footpath with the proper details where we have ramps and the corners are well and so all that breaks apart and then that becomes a, a problem you actually can't use the footpath. So, but it would be easy enough to do, make a competition for that and figure out how can we, in these conditions, in these different conditions compared to Europe, how can we figure out that these details are being taken care of? So it's not too complicated. And I fully agree that 
the young energy of, of studios and, and practitioners would be more than adequate um, um, to actually assist the PWD department to get that right, because they obviously don't have a, the mind frame to get those details right. And if they can get that sort of supplemented and they can still buy the 10 kilometers of granite, and we know, we know what that means when they do that, um, but at least we would get the, the footpath right. And I think that's a very, uh, probably more important than a building, like Ani says, a building anybody can do, but 10 kilometers of footpath would change a city much more than one building. Well, you know what Jane Jacobs said, if you can't walk your city, it's of no use. Exactly. And all of us have worked right. so hard for these footpaths, but unless there's political will and there's integrity, yeah. uh, there'll always be compromise in what is done in any public uh, works like footpaths. And the only thing I think which all of us have been doing, many architects and certainly you know, I too, uh, in, in a small way is we make sure that when we do a building in the city, we always make sure we redo the footpath the best way we can. It may not be beyond the build, building we work on, but at least if each and every building takes that up, it may not be seamless, but at least it will be walkable. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a disgrace that we cannot walk in our cities. You know, we've always believed at IDF to involve a, a senior bureaucrat and have politicians actually come and inaugurate our large conferences. Um, I've been criticized a lot for involving these people by the design fraternity, but I've always said that we must have them sit in on these discussions because a lot of good comes out of it. There's a lot of awareness that you know we bring to their minds. They haven't thought of a lot of things. When um, uh, you know, um, I also I also sit on the India Design Council, and design in India is under the Ministry of Industry and Commerce. In every other country, it comes under the Ministry of Culture. Right. And. Therefore, all of these things that we talk about to them in their minds translates into expenditure for the elite. When you talk about good design, when you talk about, um, you know, aesthetics, I have often been told that well, this doesn't concern us, um, you know, I, I, and I've always said design has to be democratic design. It's not about elitist, you know, el it, luxury is for the elite, but definitely not design, not architecture, but it's a different mindset. They, and, 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 and we started curating this. I said to Rinaldini, I'd like to put a bureaucrat on every panel due to this virtual complexity, complexity and all the time constraints for everyone. We simply couldn't manage to do that, but we certainly believe in it. And, and we will do so the next time around. But thank you all very much. I think we are running a little bit out of time now. Um, so um, any closing, rem uh, closing remarks, any, any um, one line takeaways for the uh, participants from the three of you? You've said a lot <laughs> and we've made many notes and every one of you has been absolutely brilliant. Uh, there was a, a talk I gave, you know, maybe about 30 years ago or 25, 30 years ago. And the title of my talk was Poor Countries Need Good Design. And I think countries like ours need good design, good design. even more than uh, mm -hmm. countries which are wealthy. Thank, thank you. Very well said. Thank you. Would you like to add anything, Sumitra? No, I... That's a great line. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic. It's absolutely true. And appropriate, the appropriate way to go. Appropriate. It's <laughs> <laughs> nice, Nails. Most definitely. Rajshri, would you like to close? Well, as I said, thank you very much. It's been um, deeply, um, uh, you know, invigorating. Lots of ideas, lots of good uh, discussions. Um, every one of you added so much value to, um, to the debate. 
Um, yes, Brinda, you started out saying we should have a platform for healthy critique. And I think um, Milani and I discussed that as well. Um, so we definitely would like to do it um, on this platform um, next coming months, perhaps. And we um, already have three I, I, candidates for our, our sessions. <laughs> yeah, our session, yes. And, um, um, you know, um, uh, Sumitro has been uh, amazing. Um, you know, all of you have been amazing. And, uh, um, uh, you know, the whole sensorial aspect of, uh, of space is, is something that is, um, um, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a feeling, but to have heard it, you know, uh, verbally sort of gives it a much larger um, kind of a dimension. And um, um, I think, um, uh, you know, that's, that's a great takeaway as well. Um, we've had actually a lot of registration for this, um, for this uh, conference. We've had 420 registrations on Zoom alone. Um, um, and I think it's gone very well. We have deeply uh, grateful for all of you to take this time off. I know all of you are working very hard um, around the clock. Um, it seems that all of us would have more time on our hands uh, during this COVID time. But even for myself, I haven't had a moment to breathe and even make calls to friends. And um, before the year ends, um, you know, at IDF, we really needed to connect, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, with the architecture and design fraternity and, um, and leave behind some good ideas to take away. Um, I must say um, our outreach partner established um, communication has done an excellent job. Media partners, Dezeen, um, uh, have featured it on their events guide. And um, Design Pataki is uh, uh, very actively, um, uh, you know, supporting this. And um, all the, the, the girls and the boys behind the screen, uh, Meher on social media, Nisha, and... Um, um, uh, and um, Siddhant, uh, thank you for keeping this glitch free, which in itself is uh, wonderful. Uh, we've had uh, uh, no technology glitches, thanks to all of you. Uh, Rinalini? No, I would just, uh, to, in addition to what you said, I would like to thank, of course, all our speakers for taking out a precious Saturday evening where you could have been sitting back and relaxing but instead chose to be here and engage with us. Thank you so much for being here and for having an honest conversation. I think that's what's important. And we do hope that we, we hope that this platform can encourage people to continue this discourse and debate and it can lead to, to greater things. Um, we, I'm sure, I, I know I am, and I'm sure a lot of our audience is taking back food for thought and can dwell on this and do something about it. But thank you all so much for being here and to our audience who has, uh, spanned across Zoom, Instagram, Facebook, and from all parts of the world who've been very patient. We do apologize to a lot of people whose comments and questions that we could not pick, but um, feel free to reach, us, reach out to us on our uh, social media handles, on our emails, so that we can try and address your queries. And of course, this is a four-part series. This is the first of the four, which, have been, which has been absolutely fabulous but we've got three more to and it's going to be every Saturday at PM on these very platforms so please tune in next week we're going to be discussing the business of architecture and what actually happens once you graduate from school because there's a whole other world that's lying out there for you and we've got a fabulous lineup of speakers we've got Sanjay Puri from Bombay we have Akshat Pad from Delhi and we've got Smita Gupta who's actually tuning in all the way from California so um, thank you all very much for being here, for kickstarting this initiative for us. And we do hope that we can see you all again in the following weeks.